Good morning, everybody. I feel like I should like stretch or something before my like, three-hour marathon here. I'd be happy with a three-hour marathon. That's pretty fast. <laughs> More like a five-hour marathon. Oprah pace or something. Uh, anyway, uh, so today we're going to pick up with a uh, discussion of state-of-the-art science results. Uh, and I've got a little bit of an outline here. Uh, it may seem like a lot, uh, but I think it'll go pretty fast. Uh, I'm going to start with a discussion, uh, not of necessarily results, but setting the stage for a lot of the results that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, and it's a discussion of, uh, I'll come back to that, um, uh, the impact of spectral retrieval uh, on the analysis of data and uh, the development uh, of that area over the last few years and, and, and how I think it's perhaps just as important as the development in our observational capabilities to obtain high quality data. Uh, before I do that, I forgot about this slide. There are a couple of recent uh, reviews that I can point you towards uh, that I think are pretty good uh, and describe a lot of the stuff that, uh, that I've been talking about and probably others have been talking about uh, this week. Uh, a fairly uh, recent paper, Exoplanet Atmospheres, Chemistry, Formation, Conditions, and Habitability by Niku Madusanan and collaborators. Uh, and then a slightly older uh, paper, but still uh, quite relevant and inter interesting, Observations of Exoplanet Atmospheres by Ian Crossfield. Okay, like I said, I'm going to start with a discussion, a quick discussion of spectral retrievals. I think Jonathan mentioned this on Monday, uh, and I just want to reinforce and, and emphasize and maybe say things slightly differently than he said about how important uh, this concept of spectral retrieval has been. Uh, and so I'm showing here a, a figure that I'll come back to later in the talk. Uh, this is the day side emission spectrum of HD 209458b uh, measured with HST WIPC3, Spitzer IRAC. Uh, and so this is observations at secondary eclipse with transit techniques. Uh, but the key thing here is that uh, from these data, uh, deriving the atmospheric properties uh, and, and trying to read them off in the spectrum is, is, is not, it's not trivial. Uh, one thing you can say is, for example, we know that the temperature is decreasing with pressure over the uh, parts of the atmosphere that we're seeing. But to precisely quantify that, you need detailed modeling, of course. And so uh, the, spectral, the advances in spectral retrieval over the last few years uh, have been really amazing. And so in this case, uh, we're deriving the, the thermal structure of the planet's atmosphere, that's the red line, and we're quantifying our confidence intervals uh, on that. Uh, and so that's really the key thing. I mean, for me, you haven't made a measurement unless you have a confidence interval. There's no such thing as a, a, a measured value. All that exists is a confidence interval or a posterior distribution. Uh, so for HD 209458b, we derive the thermal structure of the planet's atmosphere, and more importantly, using Markov chain Monte Carlo techniques, uh, we can account for, uh, we can marginalize over our ignorance uh, in the thermal structure when measuring uh, the abundances uh, of uh, different chemical species. And we can also marginalize uh, over the uh, ignorance and the abundances when determining the thermal structure. Uh, OK, so I'll come back to this specific result later, because uh, I want to say what this means. Uh, but I want to continue just this discussion of spectral retrievals. I've given uh, a list of what I think is, is probably an incomplete list, but these are a lot of the key references uh, that you could go to if you want to learn more about uh, these developments. Uh, I'd say the, the first application, really, of this uh, idea, which is coming from planetary science, uh, was by Niku Medusadon and Sarah Seeger in 2009. And since then, there's been a huge amount of development. Uh, you're fortunate to have one of the leading figures, Mike Line, is in the audience. Uh, he's done really amazing work. Uh, he and uh, Bjorn Benecke, I think, are the real leaders uh, in this area, doing uh, truly amazing stuff. Um, it was first applied uh, on transits, and that's still where it sees its widest applicability. Uh, but it's also uh, started to be used uh, for brown dwarfs uh, and for directly imaged planets. Uh, and then in addition to these, re these references that I gave here, uh, that describe a lot of the, uh, the theory uh, behind. A lot of the developments are also kind of folded into uh, data papers. Uh, and, and in fact, my group has been really lucky to work with Mike Line and Jonathan and, and folding and incorporating a lot of those developments simultaneously uh, with, uh, with publishing data. Um, and so you might also dig into some of the data papers. Interesting developments in spectral retrieval uh, have been incorporated in those papers. Uh, it seems like maybe the field is just moving so fast that you just, instead of writing a, a paper describing just the retrieval, just gets stuffed into a data paper and you go on to the next thing. So don't think the data papers are just about the data. Okay. 
Uh, okay, so the second thing I want to talk about before really diving into uh, the science results, uh, I want to say something about something that's very near and dear to my heart, which is this idea of high precision spectroscopy. Uh, and it's near and dear to my heart because I feel like this field has suffered, especially in the transits game, has suffered from uh, low quality, low information content uh, data. Uh, and that's something I, I've actually been working a lot over the last few years on, uh, is to try to you know, push that forward uh, and obtain high precision spectroscopy. And so I want to say just a few words about that. Uh, the importance. Uh, it's, it's probably obvious what the importance of that is, but uh, there's some subtleties uh, that I'd like to emphasize. And there are a few here uh, that I'll talk about. First is uh, when you have uh, low quality data uh, and low information content data, which I think are two, you know, can be two separate things, uh, the influence of your assumptions and your modeling play a big role in the outcome that you get, the result that you get. And sometimes it can be hard uh, to trace what those assumptions are. I mean, always we're trying to say, be explicit about our assumptions, but sometimes there can be hidden assumptions that kind of get you. This is a figure from one of Mike Klein's paper uh, showing, uh, I think, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, if you make uh, uniform priors on carbon and oxygen abundances, which seems like a very reasonable thing to do, you end up with, uh, in effect, a uh, bimodal prior on the carbon to oxygen ratio. You make uniform, okay, so you do a retrieval where you're trying to derive the abundances of, say, CO and H2O, and you put uniform priors on those molecules. Seems like a very reasonable thing to do. And then you get posterior distributions, and then you compute from that what the corresponding C to O ratio is. You end up effectively with a bimodal, uh, that's the red dotted line in all three panels. Uh, the three panels just represent different quality data and doing a retrieval on that. You end up with effectively bimodal po uh, uh, posterior distribution. And then if you have uh, poor data or a bad marginaliz marginalization scheme, uh, you end up just getting the prior back out. And so you can think that uh, you end up with a high C to O. C to O1, for example, is, 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 one, of the, is one of the peaks here. Uh, and so the point being that as the data get better, that's from here to here and then here, uh, you, uh, uh, the, the impact on the prior becomes less and less, right? So as, as you get very high quality data, what you had is the prior almost doesn't make a difference if it's not particularly strong. Uh, and you can get the true value. Uh, this can kind of be summed up as uh, a quote from one of Adam Burroughs' review papers, uh, too few data points in pursuit of too many quantities, which I think is a great quote. Um, right, so this is like a broadband photometry. This maybe includes some spectroscopy, and this is something like a JWST observation. So you can see you have to be careful about these hidden assumptions, and they can sometimes bite you. High precision spectroscopy, uh, you always want to be explicit about your assumptions, but high precision spectroscopy can kind of save your bacon in that uh, situation. Yes? Yeah, Dorian. Yeah, I think that's always good practice, right, is to, is to change your priors and see uh, if that changes the result, uh, for sure. Uh, yeah, I think that's, I would say that's one of the ways you can see one of his uh, optimization schemes actually uh, does deliver uh, something close to the true answer. So you might uh, try uh, different schemes for that. Uh, for example, if you're just using a standard Markov chain Monte Carlo, you might go to sort of a nested sampling uh, type algorithm. Uh, to try to further explore the parameter space. I mean, that's true in any fitting situation. Is you want to consider whether your local algorithm is appropriate in a, in a global minimization uh, problem. Yeah. Right, if the thing you really care about is the C to O ratio, you just put the C to O ratio as the, as the parameter you're solving for, and then your uniform prior on C to O uh, doesn't cause this problem, perhaps. Right. The problem comes if again, you're solving for these molecules, but if you care about the C to O, then the uniform prior combines together to give you this funky thing. Yeah. Uh, Mike, do you remember?
So it's a, sing yeah, it's a single spectrum random noise draw, and then he just fits them with different algorithms. So it's not a distribution of like a, it's not a, Monte Carlo, it's not a Monte Carlo simulation of an observational program. It's just a Monte Carlo simulation of a retrieval for a single spectrum that's been generated. Uh, okay, another thing that can uh, bite you, uh, of course, is the uh, unexpected, the presence of unexpected chemical species with strong spectral features. Uh, and I love this example. This is uh, Saturn observed as a transiting exoplanet with Cassini, uh, Dalba et al. Uh, and you have a very high quality spectrum here, uh, and a red uh, and blue lines represent different uh, models for Saturn. We should understand Saturn's atmosphere pretty well and should be able to predict uh, these spectral features uh, pretty well. Uh, but here is a, a very strong spectral feature, uh, surprisingly corresponding with, for example, this, one of the spitzer irac bands. Uh, and so this is an unexpected chemical species in the atmosphere of Saturn, giving a strong spectral feature. And you wouldn't see this, right? You wouldn't know that this is there uh, if you had just broadband photometry or poor quality spectroscopy. So high precision spectroscopy allows you to unambiguously identify uh, the chemical species that you're trying to uh, see and also identify chemical species that were not expected. Uh, and kind of one of the points I was trying to make yesterday is we should expect the unexpected in planetary atmospheres. All the planets of our solar system with substantial atmospheres will have a lot of unique qualities that would be difficult to predict a priori. So this is sort of the unknown unknowns, which I also said yesterday, and I have to uh, give a shout out to Jonathan for the Donald Rumsfeld figure. This morning I was like, I should try to Photoshop Jonathan's face here. So if any of the students want to do that for me, Photoshop Jonathan's face on an image of Donald, I would, be, I would like, I would, you get an A in the course if, if you do that, right? Okay. Uh, and then I want to say, what do I really mean about high precision data? Uh, and I want to flash back to an example a lot of people in the room might not be familiar with. This is from some of the early days of transit spectroscopy observations. Uh, this is Spitzer IRS. Uh, this is a spectrograph that, that was, that's on Spitzer, but no longer operational. Uh, it was only able to take spectra of two planets, uh, HD 209 and HD 189. This is 189, spectra of 189 obtained. Uh, and this is a comparison between data taken uh, based on just two eclipse observations. I think these are two nod positions on a slit, and then data taken with 10 eclipses. This is a slightly different instrument setup, but the real key difference is, is the difference in the, in the amount of data you have here. Uh, the paper is separated by just a year, and these spectra are very different, right? And, and, and neither of the spectra obtained based on two eclipses do you see this downturn that's clearly expected from the models at 8 micron, but only shows up once you obtain uh, a lot of data. Uh, there's a lot of art in making observations and obtaining uh, high-quality data, and some of that art is recognizing uh, when, you know, you may have collected enough photons, but you may not have an ac accurate result. We're fighting a lot of times against instrument systematics that are difficult to understand. Uh, and so, uh, obtaining more data than you think you need is often a path towards uh, convincing yourself that you've achieved a, a reliable result. Okay, so now I'm going to start talking about science results. And I'm going to come back to this figure that I introduced yesterday, uh, which I just really love. Uh, showing uh, what we know about the elemental abundances in the atmospheres of giant planets. And a lot of this talk is going to be emphasizing giant planets because uh, those are the exoplanets that we have the most data for. Uh, and I want to home in on this problem of water in the atmosphere of Jupiter. Uh, and uh, water is not, the abundance of water is not well known in the giant planets of our solar system because uh, these planets' atmospheres are very cold. It's condensed out of the observable atmosphere. We have a measurement uh, of water abundance in Jupiter's atmosphere from the Galileo in situ uh, entry probe. Uh, and it's a low number. And it's potentially explained by local meteorological effects in Jupiter's atmosphere. Uh, but this is really uh, a big question about why that abundance is so low. If it's truly uh, low, uh, and if it's not low, then what is the true value? So, as I said yesterday, exoplanets offer the opportunity to study, uh, to measure water abundances and to measure things in general that we can't measure for the solar system planets. And so this is an example of WASP-43, which I believe Laura talked about uh, yesterday. So I just want to highlight, uh, this for me is the, probably the most interesting result that, that I've been involved in in the field of exoplanet atmospheres. Uh, and it's kind of like bog standard spectra, and that's really what's exciting to me. 
is that you know, one of the first kinds of spectra that we've gotten that look a lot like the model expectations from 10, 15 years ago. We have the day side emission spectrum and the transmission spectrum of the planet measured with HST with C3, both giving water abundances uh, consistent with the solar, uh, the expectation for a solar composition gas, combining these uh, and making some assumptions about the uh, abundance pattern in the planet's atmosphere gives us an oxygen uh, abundance. Uh, that we can use as a metallicity proxy in the planet's atmosphere and start doing comparative planetology uh, between uh, the planets uh, of our solar system and exoplanets. And so uh, this figure, Laura must have shown this yesterday, uh, showing the expectation for the metal enhancement, uh, the, the decrease in metal enhancement in the atmospheres of giant planets as you go to higher masses. WASP-43 is fitting comfortably on the uh, extrapolation of the trend uh, seen in the solar system. Uh, which is truly remarkable, right? Uh, because we're talking about metallicity estimates for the solar system planets based on methane spectroscopy. And this exoplanet, which is two Jupiter masses orbiting its host star with a period less than a day, uh, and we're pro using the oxygen abundance derived from water, uh, which, um, and making some assumptions about the abundance pattern and getting something consistent here. Uh, so for me, this is a really exciting result uh, and it points the way towards uh, the future of what we'd like to do uh, in this area. Continuing this story of water abundances, though, uh, I want to offer uh, an overview of a sort of contradictory result in terms of the water abundance in giant planet atmospheres. And that's uh, interpretation of transmission spectra of three hot Jupiters by uh, Niku Medusadon uh, and collaborators. This is one of the figures from the paper showing the data and then his uh, model fits uh, to the data. The key thing here is these features are typically smaller than what we expected uh, from forward models before these observations were taken. Uh, and so uh, Madhu's interpretation of these data is that uh, this could be indicative of low water abundances. Uh, and so that was actually uh, the statement that he made in this paper. And so here's this figure comparing uh, the relative, uh, relative water abundance as a function of the planet's equilibrium temperatures, the expectation from chemical equilibrium for a solar composition gas, uh, and then the expectation for a metal-enhanced giant planet atmosphere uh, based on some uh, toy core accretion model. Uh, what we see here is a couple of planets with pretty large error bars, uh, but one planet in particular with the highest quality data uh, HD 209, uh, showing a substantially lower water abundance than we expect. Lower than solar and certainly lower than the expectation from core accretion theory. Um, however, I want to offer a rebuttal uh, to this uh, idea of a low water abundance for HD 209458b. Uh, and the rebuttal has two parts. Uh, one part is uh, coming from the literature. This is a paper by Jorn Benica that was put out last year. Uh, it's on the archive. Here's his figure. Uh, so Bjorn uh, looked at transmission spectra taken with HST with C3 for a number of giant planets. And so this is kind of a confusing plot. But the one I want you to look at is this dark blue line. This is his result, uh, his model retrieval for HD 209458b. And you'll see this is a log scale. This is covering five orders of magnitude for his posterior distribution on water. They're both using spectral retrieval, Bjorn and uh, Madhu. And so what's the key difference between uh, their assumptions? Uh, the key difference is the assumptions about the presence of clouds. Uh, Madhu's retrieval was based on a cloud-free assumption, whereas Bjorn uses, uh, includes clouds in his retrieval and has some parameters that he uses to parameterize the cloud properties and uh, marginalizes over our ignorance about the presence of clouds in his der derivation of the water abundance. And so he gets a much larger uh, spread in possible values and values uh, centered on uh, solar composition. And so this really illustrates the challenge of transmission spectroscopy with the data that we can currently get, which is that we have a limited band pass and uh, limited uh, precision that we can obtain. And so there's uh, strong degeneracies in the modeling of transmission spectra to try to retrieve molecular, uh, absolute molecular abundances. Uh, you have the degeneracy between the, uh, the, the pressure, the partial pressure of uh, the absorbing chemical species, the total gas pressure, and the altitude uh, of the clouds. Yes, Ted. So 
So if I'm not mistaken, there is an observation of Jupiter kind of as a transiting planet uh, based on one of those weird solar system observations using some occultations or something like that. Yeah, right. And the result was actually surprisingly high. They, I think they claimed a detection actually of water in the atmosphere of Jupiter in transmission. Uh, but that's hard to reconcile with our remote observations just of direct spectroscopy and probably the in situ measurements of Galileo entry probe. Uh, and so I, I can't remember that reference, but maybe later if you're still interested, I could try to uh, find that. Of water, okay. The, the spectrum even that I showed just a few slides ago. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this is showing uh, a different interpretation of the HD 209458B transmission spectrum and showing uh, water abundance that's not subsolar, uh, but with a large uncertainty. Uh, so I'm coming back now to this secondary clip spectrum uh, that was obtained by my group and analyzed uh, by Mike Klein and his collaborators. Uh, it's a paper that was put on the archive just a few weeks ago. Uh, so we have a day-side emission spectrum of HD 209458B. So this is a complementary probe of the atmosphere that should, in principle, give the same result as the transmission spectrum. Uh, and so from this, uh, Mike derives uh, a water abundance marginalizing over our ignorance and all these other things, the temperature pressure profile and the abundance of a whole host of other chemical species. Uh, and so this is his posterior distribution here. And the dashed line is not the median of the distribution, although it could very well be. This is the expectation for a solar composition gas. Uh, and so uh, you can see that our derived water abundance from the emission spectrum is also consistent with solar and not indicative of subsolar water abundance. So uh, this is you know, for the specific planet of HD 209458b showing uh, probably not subsolar water abundances and consistent with this picture of WASP-43. Uh, there was a paper recently uh, by Todorov and collaborators, including Mike Line, uh, where they did uh, an analysis now not just of transiting planets, but looking at directly imaged planets, uh, which typically have a higher quality spectra than transiting planets. Uh, now, they have higher quality spectra, but there's also, I would say, much more challenging to interpret these spectra because there are a lot of unknowns about these planets. For example, you don't know the surface gravity of the planet. So you have to derive the surface gravity and the temperature uh, directly from the spectra. At the same time, you're also retrieving, say, the thermal structure, the presence of clouds, and the abundances of the chemical species. Uh, so this paper was focused on kappa and b, but they also uh, pulled together water abundance measurements from a lot of different sources. And you can see them here in the caption. Uh, and plotted them, water abundance is a function of planet temperature. There are no predictions for expectations, but, well, let's just go forward. We can just say that WAS-43b is roughly centered uh, on the solar uh, abundance of water. And so if you draw a horizontal line here, that pretty much represents the expectation in a solar composition gas. Now, there's transiting planets on here, and most of them have huge air bars. Uh, and so that you know, gives us an indication of our uh, advance for WAS-43b. This is the Medusadon result for 209, but you can say we probably move this up because of his uh, not including clouds in that retrieval. And then also looking at HR 8799, spectra I haven't shown yet, uh, but uh, results on the derived water abundance there. And so you can see here for the planets with the best data, uh, we're uh, obtaining solar uh, abundances of water, uh, which points the way towards hopefully improving the precision on the results uh, and pushing towards being able to distinguish between you know, Jupiter and Saturn-like uh, enhancements in metallicities uh, for these objects. Returning to WAS-43b, I want to emphasize this assumption. We measure a water abundance, and we try to convert that to the underlying elemental abundance. People in the solar system talk a lot about molecular abundances, and that's because in the low temperature regimes that they're dealing with, a lot of times the elements uh, making up the molecules are almost exclusively in those molecules. So for example, I talk a lot about the water abundance in Jupiter, but what I really mean in the interesting quantity is the oxygen abundance. And this works for Jupiter because basically all the oxygen is locked in the water, the water's condensed out, we can't see it, but that, that's okay. Uh, but, so I want to emphasize the thing we really care about is the underlying elemental abundance. Uh, and so we've tried to derive that for WASP-43b, but it requires a relative, a, a quite strong assumption about the abundance ratios 
uh, of the molecules, of the, of the elements uh, going into that. Uh, and the specific example of water in hot planet atmospheres relies, and using that to, as a proxy for the oxygen abundance, relies on the assumption of the carbon to oxygen ratio. And the reason is because in a solar composition gas at the temperatures of hot planet atmospheres, uh, you have quite a lot of oxygen potentially locked into other molecules. Uh, CO uh, predominantly, uh, but potentially even CO2. And so if you're trying to make an estimate of a planet's metallicity, ideally you'd make a, a, a measurement of the complete molecular inventory of the planet's atmosphere and use that uh, to assess the metallicity. And maybe even throw metallicity out altogether and say, what are the individual elemental abundances like we're trying to do uh, for the solar system? So this question specifically uh, comes down to what's the carbon abundance? Carbon would be the second most abundant volatile uh, uh, element in a giant planet's atmosphere. Uh, and so it's also considered quite important from the formation standpoint. To make this more quantitative, I show the predictions of equilibrium chemistry uh, for a host of molecules uh, as a function of uh, this carbon to oxygen abundance ratio. This is for a fixed temperature and pressure, but this is representative of what you would expect in a hot planet's atmosphere. This is a bit hotter, but you can go down to 1,000 Kelvin and it wouldn't change that much. The point being that the solar carbon to oxygen abundance ratio is about 0.5. Uh, that is, you have two oxygen atoms for every carbon atom in a solar composition gas. Given uh, the, uh, the quantum mechanical properties of these different molecules, uh, CO has the strongest binding energy of a molecule, and so it would be the first thing to form. And so if you have more oxygen than carbon, then you have oxygen going into, leftover oxygen going into uh, water. And so since you have twice as much oxygen as carbon, you basically, at a solar composition gas at these temperatures, get an equal partitioning of oxygen between H2O and CO. So that's represented kind of here by this intersection. The carbon uh, to oxygen ratio, though, if you change it uh, and, and you approach and, and even exceed one, water abundance can change by orders of magnitude. Uh, that's because you start locking up more and more of the oxygen in CO, and there's less and less available to form H2O. Once you get to a CO uh, ratio of 1 and then higher, uh, you expect orders of magnitude less water abundance. And so you can imagine if we don't have the CO ratio of the planets right in our assumption, that we could dramatically uh, underestimate the planet's metallicity, for example. It's unlikely that we've overestimated it strongly, because once you get below a CO uh, of solar, uh, then the oxygen abundance is not increasing that much as to, to, to lower uh, C to O ratio values. But certainly, if we had underestimated the C to O, we would dramatically underestimate the metallicity, the oxygen abundance and metallicity of the planet's atmosphere, just based on a, a given water abundance measurement. Um, and so this raises the question, what are the C to O ratios of uh, giant planet atmospheres? Well, we don't know them really for the solar system. But I emphasize that if we take the Galileo entry probe measurements at face value, the CO ratio for Jupiter is 3. Uh, so dramatically different uh, than uh, the solar uh, abundance pattern. And this has important ramifications for the formation of objects, uh, of, of these objects. This is a sort of classical figure now from a paper by Karen Oberg and collaborators showing the partitioning of uh, different molecules uh, the the CDO ratios of different components uh, in a uh, protoplanetary disk, the gas versus grain abundances, uh, and relating that to the radial distance from the host star in terms of the uh, frost lines of different molecules. Now, I don't think, I was just having this discussion with someone yesterday, I don't think this is a prescriptive thing saying if you measure a CDO of so something, it implies a formation at some location. But I think this just gives you an indication there is going to be a very different CDO ratio uh, depending on whether you're talking about gas or grains. And, and, and the, the physics of the pollution and, and metallicity enhancement in the giant planet atmospheres, I think, is not well understood. Uh, but this gives you a sense that you could expect very different C to O ratios from the host star value, uh, depending on the formation. Mm -hmm. These are equilibrium calculations. Uh, So I think this is uh, valuable for hot planet atmospheres uh, where at high pressure the equilibrium, it's hot enough that equilibrium is a, is a safe assumption.
And so uh, you're probably all familiar with this classic result for a high C to O ratio for a hot Jupiter, the hot Jupiter WASP-12b. Uh, this was a result by Niku Menedusidon and collaborators in, in 2011, showing here a figure from a follow-up paper by Kevin Stevenson and collaborators. The inference of a high C to O ratio for WASP-12 is based on measurements of the planet's dayside emission spectrum. Uh, there's some low-quality photometry in here, but the key thing is that you have uh, HST with C3 spectrum and the near-infrared that shows featureless uh, uh, spectrum and a dayside emission spectrum, a featureless spectrum, means either the indication no uh, chemical species that you would expect to absorb, in this case water, or an isothermal dayside uh, thermal profile. However, there is clear, there's evidence for clear absorption in spitzer irac photometry. Uh, and so this is photometry, but the ruling out of the existence of strong water absorption means that it's probably not water absorption here. It has to be the combination of other molecules. And basically, this is not the greatest figure, but basically it comes down to this is strong evidence for a high CO ratio if you take the data uh, at face value. So for WASP-12b, I mean, this is, this is one of the you know, most exciting results in the field of exoplanets. This is a thing that we can't measure for the solar system planets. Uh, we're trying to do this for exoplanets, and the first one we really do this for, we're finding such a very different uh, value from our expectations. So it's very exciting. Uh, as Laura talked about yesterday, I think, uh, we decided to uh, take another view of this canonical planet, WASP-12b, by uh, taking a transmission spectrum, and the results were quite surprising. Strong water absorption features, lack of methane absorption features. Running through the equilibrium calculations, you see the water absorption that we see is uh, too strong to be consistent with uh, high C to O. In fact, it's quite consistent with a solar C to O, and she might have run through all these plots, but what it comes down to is uh, we can rule out C to O greater than 1 at greater than 3 sigma confidence. I don't know if I have another figure on this. Uh, the point of this is it's, it's not just the abundance of water, but it's the lack of absorption from other molecules that you would expect in a high C to O environment. So this, is, this, this is assessment of the C to O ratio rests on the assumption of equilibrium chemistry, uh, but that's probably a fairly safe thing uh, for this uh, hot, uh, hot atmosphere. Uh, and so these results were uh, further reinforced by uh, an independent analysis by Bjorn Benneke. Uh, I, I hope I made the point earlier that independent retrievals are a valuable thing uh, because different groups are making different assumptions uh, and, and things like that. And so uh, Bjorn's uh, analysis of our WASP-12 spectrum also uh, is consistent uh, with a C to O less than 1, not just consistent, but stringently favors uh, C to O less than 1. Uh, and then he also performs this analysis on other WIPC3 transmission spectrum, spectra. The key thing here is that just like for WASP-12, if you see a water absorption feature, that pretty much guarantees a C to O less than 1. Because you're seeing water, if you can unambiguously identify water, uh, then the fact that you're seeing that and not some other molecular absorption means the C to O ratio has to be left less than 1. You have to have substantial oxygen in the atmosphere that's forming, that's forming water. Uh, so I think Laura's paper does uh, a great job explaining and, and, and making this case. Bjorn's is, is not so great in, in, in drawing the line between the data and this assessment of uh, the high C to O ratio. But all the assumptions are, are very similar. The modeling is done slightly differently, but the conclusions become the same, uh, which I think strengthens this idea that for these hot Jupiters, at least, we have no evidence uh, for planets with high C to O ratios. And it's quite a lot of planets at this point. We can also assess the C to O ratio for uh, non-transiting planets using high-resolution spectroscopy. So this is work coming out of Ignis Sellens group uh, in Leiden, who's pioneered the use of cryores on the VLT in this ground-based high-resolution spectroscopy approach. Uh, and so they had a paper uh, led by Matteo Brogi uh, on a non-transiting planet, HD 179949b. Who knows this planet? I guess the radio velocity folks know this planet. Uh, but the point being that uh, with this high-resolution spectroscopy technique, uh, they're actually able to look at wavelengths where you can see multiple absorption uh, features from multiple chemical species, absorption features from multiple chemical species. And so they make high signal-to-noise detections of not just water, but also CO. And, and that starts to help break the degeneracy in uh, your measurement of the C to O ratio. You might notice from these figures, we only set an upper limit on the C to O because the only thing we see is water, 
right? So we don't actually make an assessment of the carbon abundance. We just say it has to be less than oxygen because we see water. Uh, when you actually detect a carbon-bearing molecule, that gives you a much better handle on the carbon to oxygen abundance ratio. Uh, and so they've done a really careful analysis uh, showing uh, the sensitivity of their data to the C to O ratio. And they actually do a cool thing which is different than what we had done and what Bjorn Benecke had done, which is they try to derive uh, the C to O ratio uh, without the assumption of chemical equilibrium by simply adding up the volume mixing ratios of the different carbon and oxygen bearing, bearing molecules. Uh, and so this is really the right way to do it. Uh, chemical equilibrium is, is probably a safe assumption here, but it's always better to try to you know, successively res relax your assumptions uh, and do it sort of, I don't want to say this is first principles, but just to simply you know, make a purely empirical assessment of the carbon to oxygen ratio. Now, the high resolution spectroscopy is super for detecting uh, more molecules than we can with current space-based instruments. Uh, but it has strong degeneracies because you don't have uh, a measurement of the continuum. It's a purely differential measurement doing a cross-correlation. Uh, and so you have no measurement of the continuum, and so there's quite a bit of uncertainty what the thermal structure of the atmosphere is, where you are on that thermal profile, uh, and that sort of thing, which, which makes it difficult uh, to make super precise measurements of the C to O. I don't, uh, I, would, I would say it's probably broadly consistent with what they found, uh, but I don't know that for sure. But I would be shocked if it wasn't. I mean, the, the point is, is they, I mean, you can look at this figure. They detect water, they detect CO, they don't detect methane, which is exactly what you expect for this planet. So the detection of methane would be the thing that's kind of wonky. Mark? <laughs> Okay. Yeah, okay. Oh, that's really interesting. I hadn't thought of that. I don't know if we're at the 15, 20% level yet, right? But that's definitely something to keep in mind. I don't know the temperature. Um, I, it's probably, you know, 2,000 Kelvin, 1,500, 2,000 Kelvin. I think it's, it's definitely... That's, that's, that's right. I, I'm pretty sure this planet is, is well into the safe regime in terms of temperature. It's very hot. I mean, it's a hot Jupiter, so it's 1,500 plus uh, Kelvin, I would say. Uh, okay. Uh, so these figures uh, show their, like, uh, basically, their chi-square uh, contours. Uh, and they're showing, they have to make different assumptions about the, uh, the temperature uh, structure. So this is really the lapse rate, uh, whether it's uh, a steep or shallow. Uh, temperature gradient in the atmosphere. Uh, I think there are also assumptions about the, yeah, about the, the C to O to methane abundance ratio. So maybe they do have some assumptions about chemical equilibrium in there. Since they don't detect CH4, uh, they only have an upper limit on that. But basically you can see these chi-square contours uh, dip down uh, and are centered uh, around the solar C to O of about 0.5. If they assume chemical equi equilibrium, they probably would also get a sharp cutoff at C to O1. Uh, but you can see this is, again, for a non-transiting planet using a completely different technique and a set of assumptions, uh, evidence against uh, very high C to O ratios. Again, for hot Jupiters. Uh, changing gears a little bit and now talking about direct imaging, uh, I've said the spectra for directly imaged planets are typically better than we have uh, for transiting planets. and so. Here's really the classic example of that. This is a very uh, high quality spectrum of one of the HR 8799 planets. Uh, really great paper by Quinn Konopaki and collaborators. Uh, this is a Keck spectrum, a Psi spectrum. This is an R of 4000 spectrum, uh, which is really just fantastic. And showing absorption features of water, CO, and now an actual strong detection of methane. And so modeling uh, done by Travis Barman uh, for this planet and also uh, for one of the other planets in the system in another paper, they're doing similar chi-square maps uh, as a function of the C to O ratio. Uh, and here, they're also constraining the C to O ratio to be less than 1. Uh, and interestingly, they're getting hints of a non-solar C to O ratio. And so I'd say this is really the only evidence that we have of, of non-solar C to O ratio, slightly uh, higher C to O ratios, a little bit more carbon in the atmosphere than we expect for solar composition gas. Although I think the, 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 the errors here are still quite large. 
Uh, but this points towards, you know, this is one, I think, a definitive result. We haven't seen any planets with high CO ratios, and we've looked at a fair number already. Uh, we've looked at more planets outside the solar system than inside the solar system. Right, that's cool. Uh, and then we're uh, pointing the way towards getting, you know, as the data improve, and for sure, you know, I'll talk about that in the next lecture this morning, the expectations for the improvement in the data. As that improves, uh, we're refining our techniques for extracting this really key piece of information that traces the formation of these objects. Great. Um, so I wanted uh, to keep going here and say, we, I spent a lot of time talking about the water abundance as a proxy for the metallicity and whether we can assume C to O of solar and everything. Uh, I want to give you a preview of a new result that's coming out by Kevin Stevenson, uh, which is uh, taking a metallicity estimate and doing it for a different molecule. Uh, so this is doing something similar as we've done for WASP43B using water. And this is again WASP43B, uh, but doing it now for a carbon-based mo uh, molecule and using that as a proxy of the metallicity. Uh, and so uh, the, the data are, are with C3 uh, phase resolved spectroscopy of WASP43, and now phase resolved uh, phase curve observations, phase resolved photometry with Spitzer IRAC. Uh, and so these are the spectra and the points taken at different phases, uh, modeling the thermal structure uh, done by Mike Line. The key thing, though, is uh, I'm not a big fan of photometry, uh, but in this case, we have spectroscopy that fairly well locks down the thermal structure of the atmosphere and the abundance of water. And so assuming there are no weird molecules in the planet's atmosphere, which we can't rule out because it's just photometry, the Spitzer IRAG data are actually strongly uh, constraining uh, the, not just, not the CO or CO2, but the combined uh, quantity uh, molecular abundance CO plus CO2. Uh, and so this is, this is not the most like sort of, sort of say rigorous way to, to, to estimate a metallicity, but it's just kind of a fun, fun thing to do to see if we take, if we retrieve the total molecular abundance CO plus CO2, uh, how does that compare assuming chemical equilibrium to what we expect for a solar composition gas? And so this is the figure from Laura's paper uh, showing the water abundance recreated. Now the water abundance is shown in red, and now we have this green point which represents the metallicity estimate for CO plus CO2. Uh, and so I, I saw that and I just was shocked because I would never think this would work. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> I never think this would work, uh, but it agrees remarkably well with the dayside uh, and transmission water abundance for WASP43B. Uh, here, uh, there's a point for the night side, but I would say ignore that uh, uh, in this discussion. The error bars here also, I think, slightly underestimated and we're still working on that. But uh, if the error bars get bigger, then the consistency will only get better. Uh, so this kind of, again, points the way towards the future. As I said, we want to take the complete molecular inventory of these planets' atmospheres, ultimately, uh, and look at these abundances and compare them. What are their ratios? What are their absolute values? What are the predictions from the formation models for core accretion and gravitational instability and different size planetesimals and things like that? So I've been speaking about the metallicities of giant planet atmospheres. Uh, but, uh, of course, a lot of work in the field of exoplanets is to push towards smaller and smaller planets. And so uh, a big thing that's been going on in the field, say, for the last six years, is the question of uh, what are the atmospheres of smaller exoplanets like? Neptunes and sub-Neptunes, super-Earths. Uh, and so to motivate uh, this study of these objects, uh, I'm showing a figure from uh, one of Jonathan's papers uh, from a few years ago where he's actually trying to make predictions about the metallicities of uh, planets' atmospheres based on core accretion uh, model formation uh, and uh, seeing how um, the uh, metallicities of the planets' atmospheres would expect to be different as a uh, with mass. And so I said there's this known trend in the solar system. You go to smaller masses, the metallicity of the planets' atmospheres go up. Uh, and this is, model is broadly consistent with that. Uh, as you go to smaller planets, uh, the metallicities of the atmospheres go up. There's an intrinsic spread uh, in the distribution because of just the randomness of planet formation. Uh, there's also different expectations depending on your assumptions of planetesimal size, and there's probably a whole lot of other physics uh, that's been, uh, uh, assumptions have been made about and that could be relaxed. Uh, but this gives you the motivation. Uh, we have the solar system trend. We have this expectation from core accretion theory. What are the metallicities of the atmosphere of the smaller planets? To further motivate this, 
I'm showing here uh, a, the latest version of the mass radius diagram for small planets, transiting planets, where we've measured these quantities to fairly high precision. Uh, and I want to emphasize here that we're studying the atmospheres of these smaller planets not just to get a constraint on their formation, but to get a constraint on their actual fundamental nature. And the reason I'm not talking about this for giant planets is because when a planet becomes big enough, we know it has to be a big ball of hydrogen and helium gas. There's no way around that. But for smaller planets, we can measure the density from the mass and radius, measurements of the mass and radius, but this does not uniquely determine the interior structure and bulk composition of the planet. Uh, and so the reason is because you can imagine making a planet out of at least three layers, uh, iron, rock, silicate, and now volatiles, uh, and uh, hydrogen and helium gas. And so when you only have two knowns and, a number, and more than two unknowns, you obviously can't get a unique solution. Uh, and so we want to understand you know, the fundamental natures of these objects. And so uh, the atmospheres offer a way to get further constraints on that. You can constrain your model for the interior structure of the planet if you can say something, uh, uh, if you can give a boundary condition about what the atmosphere is made out of. Certainly in the extreme parts of this diagram, the low density and high density planets, we know a little bit more. But a lot of these planets are in this overlapping regime of are they rocky? They're volatile rich. What are the masses of their gas envelopes? The quintessential example of this degeneracy in the interior structure is the planet GJ1214b, the second discovered transiting uh, super Earth. This is a figure from uh, Leslie Rogers and Sarah Seeger, uh, published right after the planet was discovered, showing the degeneracy in the interior structure models using even a fairly simple interior structure model uh, where you have an, uh, uh, an iron core, a silicate mantle, uh, perhaps uh, volatile species uh, layer in a gas envelope. Uh, and the point is that you cannot uniquely constrain uh, the composition of the planet uh, from just the measured mass and radius. Uh, and so this was uh, a big thing for a while. Uh, it's kind of lost steam recently, but it was a big thing for a while to try to make an assessment of the atmospheric composition to give a boundary condition to the interior structure models. And so th these were calculations done by Eliza Millariki and Jonathan Fortney, also right after GJ1214b was discovered, showing how you could have very different atmospheric compositions for the planet, and that would lead to very different spectra that should be uh, detectable uh, with the existing instruments. Here, we're not trying to just measure precisely the molecular absorption feature, uh, but we're just trying to make a broad brushstroke differentiation between spectra with large features and spectra with small features. And the uh, idea here hinges on the fact that the size of spectral features depends strongly on the uh, scale height of the atmosphere. This is an equation that I introduced yesterday. The scale height depends on the mean molecular weight of the atmosphere. And for small planets, the mean molecular weight of the atmosphere can change by an order of magnitude. You can go, for example, from a hydrogen-helium atmosphere with a mean molecular weight of two in dimensionless units uh, to something that's dominated by water or even CO2, so 20 or 40, right? So if the mean molecular weight can change by an order of magnitude, the scale height can change by an order of magnitude, the sizes of the features can change by an order of magnitude. And so that's what we were trying to do with atmospheric studies of this planet, uh, GJ1214b, and that's really kind of the atmospheric studies of super-Earth's uh, question. Uh, I don't know, did Laura show this yesterday? She might have showed. This is a, this is a classic spectrum now. Really, the benchmark result uh, for the atmospheres of super-Earths uh, that Laura published a couple of years ago now, where we used a substantial amount of Hubble Space Telescope time to make a deep observation of the transmission spectrum of GJ1214b. Uh, and this uh, spectrum has unfortunately come out to be completely featureless, uh, but it's featureless at a level that's very constraining for the atmospheric composition of the planet. We rule out clear atmospheres with all sorts of high mean molecular weight uh, compositions. And so this is one of the few definitive pieces of evidence for clouds and the existence of transiting planets. Unfortunately, it doesn't reveal what the clouds are made out of. But it's extremely constraining in terms of the uh, cloud top pressure. So we can marginalize over the uncertainty in the cloud top pressure and rule out water abundances in clear atmospheres over a wide range of parameter space. So this is the retrieval that was led by Bjorn Benica. Uh, for the GJ1214b transmission spectrum. You can see that we constrain clouds to be at very low pressures, at very high altitudes, no matter what our assumption about the water abundance in the atmosphere is. Unfortunately, this has continued to be the theme for super-Earth atmospheres, 
uh, albeit at less precision and less constraining, there's 436b. It's not a super Earth, it's actually a, a super Neptune, uh, but still maybe in this category of smaller planets that we're trying to make assessments of the metallicity of the atmosphere. And then another super Earth, HD 97658b. So these are all HST with C3, with C3 spectra that rule out cloud free hydrogen dominated atmospheres. They don't real, rule out clear high mean molecular weight atmospheres. Uh, but I would say, given what we see for GJ1214b, consistency here suggests uh, very high altitude clouds is the likely uh, explanation here. Now there is one exception, and this is a, uh, a very important and exciting exception, uh, and that's uh, the planet Hat P11. Some, its uh, mass is about 20 times the mass of the Earth. So it's not in the super-Earth regime, but it's still in this category of smaller planets. Again, HST with C3, but now we're seeing for the first time in this, in this mass regime of transiting planets, uh, the detection of water uh, absorption in the planet's atmosphere. So this is super exciting because not all of these planets have uh, completely obscured atmospheres. Transmission spectroscopy can tell us fundamental things about the atmosphere besides just clouds, as interesting as they might be. Uh, unfortunately, though, the possible existence of clouds, again, makes the metallicity estimate based on just this spectrum alone uh, quite difficult. There's a strong degeneracy between the uncertain cloud top pressure and the metallicity of the planet's atmosphere. Again, this retrieval was led by Bjorn Benica. Basically, you have this one sigma contour, uh, which uh, is quite broad in terms of the allowed metallicities, just at one sigma. If you uh, return to that figure from Laura's paper and try to put hat P11 on it, uh, this is what you get. So this is the red line would represent the one sigma confidence interval on the metallicity based on the water abundance retrieved for HAT-P11. Uh, so unfortunately, the existing data are, are not strongly constraining, but again, it points towards uh, a promising future for these kinds of observations. If we can make higher precision observations, perhaps over a wider range of wavelengths, we can break the degeneracy between the clouds and the molecular abundances and start populating this diagram over a range of masses. Yes? Uh, so let's, let's save that discussion for the next lecture, because I've put that in my open questions. Uh, and maybe we can actually have a discussion about ideas on how to do that. I have one slide that's kind of like, you know, the centerpiece of this discussion. We can talk about that. I think it's an important, a really important question. Yeah. Uh, okay, so that's HAT P11. Uh, and then some of you may be familiar uh, with this recent result on the Super Earth 55 Canker E. Again, HST with C3. Uh, this is a spectrum that's uh, also not seemingly flat, uh, and the UCL group of Giovanna Tanetti uh, and collaborators uh, have interpreted this spectrum to indicate uh, low mean molecular weight atmosphere, so a hydrogen dominated atmosphere, uh, with an absorption feature caused by HCN. Uh, and so this is their figure in the caption. I'd say the jury is still out on the reliability of this spectrum and their interpretation uh, of the spectrum. Uh, but it, again, it, it points towards you know, a potentially exciting future that not all of these planets are going to have completely obscuring clouds. We should be able to make measurements and ultimately get that science uh, that I've been talking about out of the data. Right. Right, so um, from the observational standpoint, which is really all I can speak to, maybe Mike has ideas about the theory too and in the, in, in the interpretation. 55 Cancri is the hardest target that WIF C3 has ever pointed at. And you'd be like, why is that hard? 55 Cancri is not, 50, it's called 55 Cancri because it's a bright star, right? Uh, and that's a good thing. I hear that's a good thing. For WIF C3 though, this star is probably too bright. And so you collect a huge number of photons, but the instrument systematics depend on the photon count rate, and at higher photon count rate, the systematics are worse. And it's a doubly difficult problem because you've gathered all these photons. You think your photon limited precision should be uh, quite good, but your systematics have gotten worse. And from what I've seen uh, of these data, and my group has been observing 55 Canker E, not in transit with WIFT-3, but in secondary eclipse, but using the same exact observing mode, and it's extremely difficult to reliably pull out the spectrum of the planet. Uh, from these measurements. And we even have four eclipses of the planets. This was based on two transits. Uh, so we have twice as much data uh, and we're expecting to see the same planet spectrum in all four of these data sets. 
and it's still very, very difficult. Here, with just two, I just, I just don't feel that they can remove the instrument systematics uh, at this level. At secondary eclipse, so it's a different, yeah, it's, but it's essentially the same observation, right? It's the same time series observation with the same instrument, the same scan rate, same read mode, same everything, just observations at secondary eclipse. We have, it's, we, no, we have no idea. We may not even be able to pull out a spectrum. That's how hard it is. It may just, the whole point of that observing exercise may just be, this target is too hard for this instrument. Uh, Okay, uh, so I also want to highlight uh, a new result uh, that came out for the TRAPPIST planets. Uh, this is uh, a, a, a group of planets orbiting uh, a planet right at the uh, stellar, substellar mass boundary. TRAPPIST-1, this is a, a composite transit observation seeing uh, simultaneous transits of planets B and C observed with HST with C3 uh, by DeWitt and collaborators. From this uh, double transit, they get a joint constraint on the transmission spectra of both planets. Uh, I haven't dove into this paper to see like, exactly how they do this, but you can imagine just a sort of hand wavy argument. You see two transits, you do a composite model, uh, and this is what you get. Uh, and so these data, these, these first observations of now earth size exoplanets uh, rule out cloud-free uh, hydrogen-dominated atmospheres. Uh, I want to point out that I don't trust the statistics uh, in this paper, uh, and you can see why if you look at this figure. This is where they try to derive the spectrum of just uh, one of the planets. They, can, they say that the blue line is inconsistent at two sigma from these data, yet the blue line goes through the errors on all of the points, which wouldn't even be expected at one sigma. Um, and so uh, I'm a little nervous about their statistics. Especially in this case, this H2O cloud-free atmosphere, I don't think is ruled out at four sigma. Uh, this is so this H-rich cloud-free atmosphere is probably not ruled out at 19 sigma. But you can see that's strongly discrepant. So the main conclusion from the paper is unaffected. Uh, but I'm a little uh, concerned about how they've done their uh, statistics here. Yeah, 300, I'd say, on the composite spectrum. The star is fainter than uh, GJ1214, uh, but it's also the um, star is a lot smaller, too. Uh, so that helps in your sensitivity. OK. But again, this is not, uh, these you know, don't start to be definitive results, but really it's really pointing the way towards the future of what we want to do. So uh, the discussion of small uh, trans transmission spectra of small exoplanets uh, has uh, focused a lot on the existence of clouds. And so I want to back up and go back to giant planets and talk about what evidence we have for the existence of clouds on those objects. Uh, this is a really nice paper by David Singh and Jonathan and collaborators that came out this year uh, showing a family portrait of hot Jupiters with spectra uh, from the optical to the inf near infrared and out to the, uh, the thermal infrared. Uh, and this sort of family portrait paints a picture of prevalent cloud absorption uh, in the planet's atmospheres. Uh, and they did this really clever analysis uh, where they looked at uh, the uh, ratio and the transit depth uh, from the near infrared to the Spitzer wavelengths and then calculated some toy models uh, uh, to see what you would expect for the size of the water absorption feature at the WIPC3 wavelengths relative to this uh, color measurement. Uh, and you can see these toy models. This is clear atmospheres with differing water abundances. 
and then two different prescriptions for clouds. One they just call cloudy, which I guess is a gray cloud, and then another has uh, hazy, which is an enhanced Rayleigh scattering cloud, right? Uh, and so you can see uh, the measurements, the individual measurements uh, are fairly low precision uh, for the most part, but taken as a group, they're uh, broadly consistent with the cloudy and in particular the hazy uh, model for these planets' atmosphere. This is further evidence against uh, subsolar water abundances uh, for these hot Jupiters, uh, now in sort of a uh, statistical uh, point of view. Uh, I, I like this paper for a number of reasons. I thought this is, it, this is very clever in terms of creating this, uh, this color, uh, color versus uh, fi uh, spectral feature size, and also because it's the power of exoplanets that's still not widely used in the atmospheres game which is the power of statistics. Right? You may ask yourself, well, if there's still so many mysteries about the atmospheres of the planets of our solar system, we should just keep studying those because we'll get a lot more data. We can actually go there and send a probe and land there and that sort of thing. Uh, but for exoplanets, uh, we have just a power in numbers, right? And that's, uh, we can use that. And so I think this is probably the first example of that being used. And I think this is going to be an important thing to continue doing in the future. We'll never have as much data and as high quality data as we have for the solar system planets. But we have thousands of planets, right? There's a, there's a power in that. Clouds have also been uh, indicated from uh, measurements of uh, uh, hot Jupiter albedos. This is a paper by Vivian Parmentier uh, looking at albedos, geometric albedos derived from uh, Kepler light curves of transiting uh, hot Jupiters uh, and showing the very complicated behavior of the albedos of the planets as a function of their temperatures but then perhaps explaining that by uh, the uh, complicated uh, chemistry involving different cloud species appearing and, and, and raining out as you change the temperature. This highlights um, how you have all these expectations for cloud species condensing out and existing for you know, a, a narrow temperature range uh, and, then, uh, and then settling out of the atmosphere, perhaps being lost on the cold night side of the planet from mixing effects and how you, you don't expect at all any sort of linear relationship between the albedo and the equilibrium temperature because you've got these cloud species coming in and out. Uh, I thought this was a really great paper uh, with a model uh, that's, that's re reproducing some somewhat mysterious results in terms of the diversity of geometric albedos for hot Jupiters. Clouds are not only affecting transmission spectra, but they could potentially affect dayside emission spectra. This is, of course, widely appreciated in the direct imaging and brown dwarf communities where they're taking essentially you know, uh, um, day side spectra like we do for transiting planets and seeing the evidence for clouds. As I said yesterday, the slant viewing geometry of transits makes clouds more prominent in transmission spectra, but they could also uh, be present uh, in the spectra obtained with a normal viewing geometry. So this is uh, Mike's paper on HD 209, which I showed one figure from earlier. This is another figure where he's uh, done what I think is the first consideration of clouds and the emission spectra of transiting planets. Uh, and he found that fortunately for this object, the uh, presence of clouds probably doesn't have an influence. Uh, and so our conclusions about the thermal structure and the water abundance are unchanged whether we include a cloud in our modeling or not. But this is a reminder that clouds could be important in emission spectra, and especially as we go to cooler objects in the JWST regime. Uh, we want to keep this in mind. So this, is, this kind of modeling is going to be more and more important. As I said, clouds are uh, very well known and are, are really dealt with in the brown dwarf and direct imaging communities. Uh, you have strong evidence for the existence of clouds uh, in color magnitude diagrams of field brown dwarfs and also uh, when you put the directly, directly imaged planets on there. Uh, the, uh, well-known LT transition represents perhaps a transition uh, in uh, the cloud properties in brown dwarf atmospheres. And then also in the spectra of directly imaged planets, uh, you see evidence uh, for clouds. I think I just have one figure uh, from one of Andy Skimmer's papers uh, showing the interpretation of uh, data for HR 8799, some photometry and spectrophotometry uh, for this planet. Uh, and how it can only be reproduced, really, by models that include uh, clouds. I'm not really an expert on this, so I'm just going to leave it at this. Uh, but certainly you have a lot of experts uh, in the room right now and, and, and as the workshop continues, uh, Mark Marley and uh, Andy Skimmer and others. Uh, just as a sort of break here in the middle, 
I want to uh, share with you an email uh, conversation I had with Cam Kevin Zonla. I was reading Kevin's uh, and collaborator's paper uh, talking about hazes on 51 Airy B, one of the new directly imaged planets, and I was struck by this shocking sentence here, uh, the talking about different uh, possible cloud and haze uh, particles. The familiar candidate is an organic photochemical haze, loosely analogous to the hazes seen over Titan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Pluto. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or Beijing. What doesn't fit in this list of three? So I sent an email to Kevin. I said, if I was the kind of person to tweet, I would have posted this last night, only to the imagi imaginative minds like Zonla et al. or Titan and Pluto as accessible as Beijing. And Kevin wrote back, to a NASA employee, Titan and Pluto are more accessible than Beijing. <laughs> and then referenced this uh, news article talking about the restrictions uh, from the federal, from federal government employees and collaborating uh, with the Chinese. And so, um, man, exoplanets is a lot of fun, right? <laughs> There's a lot of characters uh, out there and uh, we can have a lot of fun with this stuff. Anyway, <sighs> okay, am I getting tired or is it just me? Yeah, anyway. Uh, so we've got another 20 minutes to go and I think I'll get through these slides. Uh, changing gears again, going down my laundry list of stuff that I'd like to talk about, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the idea of non-equilibrium chemistry. This is something we've already talked about a little bit, uh, and I've said, oh, don't worry about it, everything's in equilibrium, we measure the water abundances and everything's just hunky-dory, uh, but everything might not be hunky-dory. Uh, you could have evidence for non-equilibrium chemistry. Uh, and so that's actually uh, been a question uh, that's been around uh, for quite some time in the transiting game, because some of the early measurements of uh, photometry and spectra were not reliable, but people thought they were good. And so they started doing analyses and modeling and they got wonky molecules completely inconsistent with, uh, with the expectations for, for chemical equili equilibrium. Uh, and so it was a big thing some time ago. And this is, a, I think, a little fallen a little bit out of a favor, but hopefully it comes back as the data start to improve. This idea of measuring molecular abundances with modern retrieval techniques and trying to assess whether you're in equilibrium or not. This is a, a figure from one of Mike's papers uh, from his thesis, I, I think, uh, plotting the uh, equilibrium constant uh, for the, um, this is showing the balance between the partial pressures of methane, water, and CO, uh, plotting this equilibrium constant, which depends on the Gibbs free energy, as a function of temperature and plotting uh, the empirical measurements of the equilibrium constant as determined from the abundances of those chemical species measured in the atmosphere versus the expectation. Uh, and so you can see here for most transiting planets, the error bars are large and you're, and you're consistent uh, with chemical equilibri equilibrium. Uh, and uh, a lot of these data, these are, these, this is somewhat dated now because the data have gotten a lot better over the last couple of years from HST with C3. And so you could redo this plot, but probably for most of these planets it would be uh, very similar. Uh, but a couple of planets stick out in terms of uh, being evident for uh, disequilibrium chemistry, uh, and in particular for our measurement of low methane abundances. Uh, GJ436b, a transiting planet, uh, and this inference is coming from secondary eclipse photometry. And then hr 8799b, one of the directly imaged planets, so this is a directly image measurement. So for GJ436b and HR7, uh, well, I think for 436b, there's a complete absence of methane seen in the spectrum of the planet. For the HR8799b, there's methane uh, detected, uh, but a very low abundance. And so this could be evidence of mixing and quenching of uh, CO and CH4 uh, from deep inside uh, the planet's atmosphere. Whew, no questions about that. Um, Moving on to uh, uh, sort of more indirect evidence uh, for non-equilibrium chemistry, I think the spectrum of uh, the transmission spectrum of GJ1214b, it's extreme flatness and featurelessness, uh, which indicates clouds at very high altitude is perhaps indicative of uh, photochemistry happening in the planet's atmosphere. Uh, this is a figure from one of Caroline Morley's papers showing uh, models where they try to reproduce the featurelessness of the spectrum using different cloud models. Uh, and for me, the one that seems most believable is the cloud model based on uh, photochemical haze production uh, rather than uh, equilibrium condensates. 
Uh, and so this is the figure from that showing how you really, uh, even in this photochemical regime, you have to have a very high, I think this is a conversion factor from the, the photochemical precursors to hydrocarbon carbon soots, if I'm right, this F factor is that conversion factor, right? Uh, and so um, this could be, this is more indirect evidence than, 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 than actually measuring, for example, the methane abundance of non-equilibrium chemistry. Uh, but this could be, you know, perhaps the first evidence, the first real hint of photochemistry in influencing uh, the abundances of chemical species in exoplanet atmospheres. Uh, changing gears again, we're going to talk about the thermal structure now. Uh, and I introduced this topic by referencing back to the thermal structures of the atmospheres of planets in the solar system. Here's Earth's thermal structure, which is extremely uh, important for our existence. Uh, and the thermal structures of the planets, uh, uh, the giant planets. An interesting uh, common thread between these thermal profiles is the existence of uh, thermal inversions. That is, uh, as you move up in the atmosphere, the temperature decreases till you reach the point which you uh, might call the tropopause, and then there's an increase in temperature to higher altitudes. The existence of thermal inversions in the atmospheres of our solar system planets is caused by the irradiation uh, from the sun and the existence of chemical species that are absorbing shortwave uh, radiation uh, from the sun and heating uh, the atmosphere. Thermal inversions were... Uh, were considered for exoplanets and even thought to perhaps exist. Some of the first Spitzer photometry measurements of the spectral energy distributions of transiting hot Jupiters revealed some anomalous results that were perhaps attributed, uh, attributable to uh, thermal inversions. The classic example is the dayside emission spectrum for HD 20945AB, uh, measured just in photometry, which is you know, tricky. Uh, but the ratio of the uh, 4.5 to 3.6 micron channel, uh, where the 4.5 micron is showing a deeper secondary eclipse than 3.6, is indicative uh, this should be an absorption band. And if the absorption band goes up, the temperature has to be higher, higher in the atmosphere. So that's this green line. So this was first proposed by Heather Knudsen, uh, Adam Burroughs, and collaborators in a couple papers uh, uh, from about nine years ago. And then this figure is from Medusadon and Seeger showing a retrieval of uh, inverted thermal profile based on these data. So the thermal inversion was formally only about a two sigma result uh, taking the spitzer irac photometry at face value. Uh, but still, it was a very persistent idea uh, that led a lot of people to propose that as an explanation for some weird data that they got for other planets uh, and proposed uh, it, it motivated theorists to look for chemical species that could be causing the thermal inversion. It motivated people to try to understand why some planets would have it and some planets didn't. Uh, and it motivated observations at other wavelengths to look for the absorption signature, say, in the transmission spectra of these planets to find that, that chemical species. Uh, so my group has had done a couple of papers now on HD 209458B. Uh, first, we uh, reassessed uh, the spitzer irac points and found that some of them changed uh, dramatically based on newer observations, better observing modes, and better data reduction techniques. And then uh, the real uh, ultimate thing is to get a spectrum of the planet, so a WSD3 uh, spectrum of the planet. Uh, again, this is day side emission. And so uh, putting this together, you see in the spectrum, and this is really the power of spectroscopy, right? This is the clear, unambiguous absorption feature of water. So you can say, just from reading this off the figure, water is present in the atmosphere in substantial amounts, and the temperature decreases as you go to lower pressures over the part of the atmosphere that you're seeing. You just read that off the figure. Doing the retrieval to quantify that, you get this thermal structure, which is inconsistent with a thermal inversion at very high uh, confidence. Uh, so thermal inversions uh, not existing in 209458b, the original planet that this was proposed for and really set this uh, a whole area of investigation into motion. This has also been uh, confirmed and consistent with uh, measurements from the ground based on high resolution spectroscopy. This is a figure from Henrietta Schwartz uh, from Ignaz Selen's group using CryRes at the VLT. They were not able to make an unambiguous detection of absorption in the planet's atmosphere that would be consistent with uh, no thermal inversion, but they were able to reel out, rule out the strong thermal inversion that had been originally proposed. The point being that if you have this strong white, uh, yellowish white, that represents a sort of a hit. You're playing Battleship. It's like hit, 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 miss, 
right? You miss with a strong inversion. Uh, and so that's uh, not detected and, and, and ruled out. Uh, but they can't distinguish between uh, narrow, broad absorption and a weak inversion. Uh, whereas with, with our data, uh, we can. But this is, this is really, uh, really nice that we get these consistent results for the same planet with very different uh, techniques. We can compare this to the predictions of uh, 1D models. Uh, and so I think this is really uh, exciting. We calculate some 1D models with Jonathan's code uh, with different levels of redistribution, the black lines, and see that our retrieved model, whether we include, this is which version of this? Well, there's two versions of the parameterization for the TP profile, and it's consistent with some intermediate redistribution factor. You see the, the, the slope and the change in this is very similar to the prediction from the 1D radiative convective model. Um, so this is suggesting uh, a, a reality that we're actually seeing, which is comforting. Thermal inversions are not dead, though. Uh, recently, there have been a series of papers uh, for super hot, hot Jupiters, uh, suggesting the possible presence of inversion or the chemical species that could cause inversions. Here's a spectrum of uh, WASP-33b. This is a planet with an equilibrium temperature of about 3,000 Kelvin. So this is approaching stellar uh, temperatures for the planet. Uh, the WIFC-3 spectrum, uh, and this is a ground-based point, and some, there's some Spitzer data and another ground-based point, uh, suggest weakly, in my view, uh, the possible existence of an inversion. To me, the WIFC-3 spectrum looks like a black body, which is actually consistent with what I see for other hot planets. I think I have a slide on that coming in a second. And it's really this one photometry point that's driving this idea of an inversion rather than just an isothermal atmosphere. But still, uh, this, is, you know, this is a very different temperature regime than HD209, uh, and so it's not unreasonable to expect that a very different kind of thermal structure for the atmosphere. So the thermal inversion idea has maybe, you know, has, has morphed into something else, uh, and it's still out there. Now, in terms of detecting the chemical species that could give rise to that, this is what I mean, uh, WASP-121, again, an HSD with C3 spectrum, this shows water absorption, but if you combine with some Again, ground-based photometry, you have the possible existence of TIO. Uh, TIO is one of the chemical species that was thought to potentially cause uh, thermal inversions. And so it'll be interesting to see what the day side spectrum of this planet looks like and higher precision data here in the optical to actually see, to tell us whether we expect, uh, we, we are actually seeing TIO, uh, which would be a first uh, in this planet. And this is a very hot planet, again. Uh, it's very different from HD209. Some of the data from my own group uh, have uh, suggested the possible existence of two classes of highly irradiated uh, uh, thermal structures in planet atmospheres. Uh, for WASP-43 and 209, which I've talked about a lot, we see this clear absorption signature of water. Uh, but for WASP-12 and unpublished data for WASP-103, and also not shown on here, WASP-18, much hotter planets, we see what look to be, at least over the WIFC-3 band pass, isothermal black body-like spectra. Uh, and so uh, I think one of the open questions is uh, trying to reconcile uh, the differences that we're seeing between these really hot planets and the sort of cooler, more canonical hot Jupiters in terms of their thermal structures. Uh, my understanding that theoretically it's very difficult to get a perfectly isothermal atmosphere. Uh, and so I think this is an interesting theoretical challenge if the data uh, continue to show this sort of divergence and in particular this phenomenon, the hottest uh, hot Jupiters. See how many more slides I have. So I'm going to talk about, yeah, so let's talk about this. Almost done. Evaporation. So changing gears to evaporation. So this is not something that I've worked on, uh, and so I'm doing my best to try to capture uh, what's going on in the literature. Planets that are very close to their host stars obviously are very highly irradiated. Uh, and uh, the high irradiation could be driving, driving mass loss uh, from the planets. This is a figure from a paper from David Ehrenreich and Jean-Michel Desert uh, from a few years ago looking at the population of transiting planets uh, and calculating uh, the expected uh, uh, mass loss uh, rates for the planet. Now it's interesting to point out, of course, that this has been observed, the actual uh, ongoing mass loss uh, of hot Jupiter atmospheres has been seen. 
The classic result is for HT209, observations at Lyman Alpha, where you see uh, a clear uh, dip in the Lyman Alpha absorption uh, before, between before and then during transit. Uh, Lyman Alpha is tough because it's absorbed uh, strongly by the interstellar medium. So that's the core here. And it's also, there's some geochronal uh, effects on this line too that make the measurements quite difficult. But if you have uh, a star that has a significant red or blue shift uh, from the Earth and, and thus has the Lyman Alpha shifted from the Earth's point of view, then you can move this Lyman Alpha out of the ISM absorption and then measure either in the wings or perhaps even see the core uh, this, this absorption. So 209 is a hot Jupiter that's been observed this way. And then also recently there was a paper by David Ehrenreich and collaborators uh, for the hot Neptune GJ436b. Uh, and this is a really stunning uh, observation. The, the absorption on 209 uh, was quite large, but uh, was still only a few percent. Now we're talking about 436b. The transit of 436b is on order of tens of percent, right? Uh, so this is suggesting the presence of a huge cloud of neutral hydrogen uh, streaming off the planet in this, uh, uh, and they, they, they're, they're, they're making this theoretical prediction. This is a theoretical prediction of how this cometary tail of neutral hydrogen is just streaming off this hunt Neptune uh, and causing this huge dip uh, in transit, much larger than the transit seen just for the, uh, the, the planet itself. Uh, so obviously this is an exciting uh, thing. The idea, idea of evaporation is probably going to become more and more important as we move to smaller planets. Uh, hot Jupiters aren't seeming to be losing substantial uh, mass, uh, and so it's really kind of in the, de in the details. But the whole evolution of smaller planets could be dramatically affected by mass loss. Uh, and so further measurements in this area are expected and, and will probably be very interesting. So how about we stop here, and I'll, I have a few more slides to go in this lecture, uh, but I think people are uh, losing focus. I'll, I'll uh, pick back up after a 30 minute break, that's okay. I'll pick back up here after a 30 minute break. I'll finish this summary of observational results, science results, uh, and then uh, I'll start talking about expectations for future facilities and instruments. Okay, so I take my speaker's privilege and say 30 minute break.